going to Japan for the first time, I had been so nervous on the plane there that I couldn't even sleep. And I was just, you know, tense and, you know, freaking out, thinking about, you know, what it would be like. And I got there, everything was so clean. I was shocked because there's, you know, tons of people, but there's not any garbage anywhere. Um, the mission president and the assistants, they picked us up and we just went directly to the mission home. And usually what they have us do is just, you know, go and talk to people, dendo, and which means like to proselyte, um, talk to people on the way um, to the mission home. But because we were the biggest um, group of missionaries that had come to our mission, they just, it was too, too many people to bombard the train in Japan. And so we went directly there that night. We met the mission president and it was just awesome. And so that next morning we went to um, the church that's by our mission home and we you know, we got our companions, they told us about the areas, and I was like, oh, I really want to go to Nagano, and I don't know why, but I felt so drawn to it, and then, of course, I got called to Nagano, my companion, she was half Japanese, and um, I'm 5'10", and I weigh a lot more than my companion, but she was like this big and 88 pounds, and so she was just really little, and oh my gosh, I loved her so much, and so we... I got my companion, and we went directly to Nagano, and it was like a let's see, four hour bullet train. So, I mean, we, we were so tired and you know, this long plane ride, we, you know, we just started talking about the investig the people that, um, are in our area. There weren't a whole lot of people that were progressing or that had much potential, but you know, there, there are lots of PIs and people that, you know, seem really awesome. And so I was just so excited. We met the ward mission leader and, um, the bishop and, when I, when we were talking to them, I had no idea what they were saying. I just, I was so tired. Like I've never been more tired in my life. And I was just like nodding and nodding. And, um, one thing that shocked me is like when we were in there in the lesson, like Japanese people, whenever, whatever you say to them, they always go, mm, 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 and like confirm everything you say. So I was just like, what are these people doing? Like, this is so weird. <laughs> and you know, they're really expressive and, of course I grew to be like that, but you know, when I first got there, that really surprised me. And, um, yeah, I mean, the first week I just was so shocked by the people. And I mean, I, I stuck out like a sore thumb there and I didn't really feel like I fit in because I'm just this, you know, tall American girl. And, um, it was fun. The Nagano, it's kind of more of a countryside area. So they didn't see as many gaijin like foreigners as you know some of the city areas and that was really fun so we would just you know go up to people and a lot of times we just talk to them about english class or um i didn't i honestly didn't know any japanese but i was like you know if i can just show god that i trust him i'll i'll mess up i'll you know make mistakes and just keep trying and um those i think that really helped my mission a lot because i wasn't afraid to make mistakes and like i you know, just went and talked to people, even if I could just say like, hey, I'm a missionary or like I'm from America. I thought that that was awesome. And so I had a lot of fun, you know, we, me and my companion, we had so much fun just kind of like meeting people and talking to people. But it was so overwhelming and the jet lag continued like all week. I think it, it took me a long time to get used to it. But, um, you know, you just get used to being tired and, you know, it was fun. A lot of times they would come up and say like, hello, or like, you know, try and talk to me or say, Gaijin, which means like foreigner. And so they, you know, I, I feel like I got a lot of like weird looks when I was there and people, everyone was just staring at me, especially me and my little companion. Like I just towered over her and, um, yeah, they, I, I was asked how tall I was like all the time, but Honestly, Japan is probably one of the safest places I've ever been in my life. Um, I, I never, I think there were only a couple times on my mission where I felt kind of like scared or because it was like dangerous or something, but it was just because there was like a weird person or something. But, um, I mean, it's so safe and I, a lot of, you can leave your bike out and even if it's unlocked sometimes I mean nobody takes it you could leave like a million dollars on the ground and I honestly don't think someone would steal it because they're just such kind people and um yeah regardless of what area I was in I always felt really safe so in the summer Japan is so hot you'll take a shower and get all dried off and then three minutes later you're just dripping sweat again because it's 
it's just humid and um you ride your bike outside and regardless of what you do you're gonna be hot and sweaty so the summers you just want to wear the coolest clothing possible and then winters I thought it was freezing and I I mean I'm from Utah so I can handle the cold but it's freezing because there's wind and it's humid and stuff and so it you know it kind of bites you a little bit more in Japan most of the men work and so a lot of them work at you know big businesses or um, factories and stuff but usually the factories are for more like minor class people and um, kind of you know same with America there's people in every different aspect of like the job world and there's so many different things that they do there's actually lots of like car production you know factories like Toyota that's one of the areas in in our mission and of course there's the Toyota industry and different places like that they have and you know it depends on the area that you're in sometimes you know we we go and do fun activities as a district and go see you know like a different shrine or a temple or something but a lot of times we would just be so exhausted that we just kind of rest and you know have to get things done I mean we did our laundry and our shopping and um some of my companions they like to write letters so they would do that and um I like to sleep because I was tired but yeah um it's really fun there's so many th fun things to see in Japan um that you know, we loved going together as districts and just even if we just got lunch together, you know, it was really fun. We usually live in apartments in the mission and I mean, they're, they're really nice living circumstances. We're really lucky and of course you sleep on a futon, which is, you know, just like a little mat and it's on the floor. So at first it won't be very comfortable, but you'll be so tired that it doesn't even matter um, and you'll just get comfortable with that. Uh, we ride we ride our bikes almost everywhere, um, th and you'll buy your own bike on when you get to the mission field. But you know sometimes if there's if, to go from you know di different meetings or something, we have to take the train. And but I also you know sometimes we'd walk and stuff. But I I would say that it's going to be a lot of bike riding, regardless of what area you serve in. Um, it, there's bike riding. The people in the different areas, um, if you go more up north, it's, you know, just Japanese people. But down south in our mission, there's more, you know, Filipinos, there's more Brazilians and Peruvians. That, and they live kind of in these apartments, apartment complexes, because they work in the factories. And so I actually taught a lot of them um, in one of my areas because I had a Brazilian companion. And so she, you know, we taught in Portuguese. Uh, she taught in Portuguese. And um, yeah, it was, it was really good, but our mission president really wanted us to focus on teaching the Japanese people so that we could strengthen the wards in our mission. Our mission, it's been around for a long time and it used to be part of the Tokyo mission, but, um, there's, I mean, there's some really old areas that goes from like Nagano and Kanazawa down to, you know, like more Southern, which is like in Aichi-ken or Mie-ken. And so there, um... There's lots of diversity in our mission. There's, you know, really big cities and there's also more countryside places. So it's just beautiful. Um, there, when I first came there, there weren't as many sister missionaries, but you know, in my mission, there was about like, I think 130 to 150 missionaries and there are 40 sisters, which is different now. Um, there, I think there's probably like 20 to 30. Um, anyway, so the, it's really big. A lot of our areas, I mean, there's usually like two to four missionaries. Um, they're like two elders and two sisters. And when I was there, there was, of course, like four sisters and two elders a lot of the times because there were so many people that came in. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's really big and they're just beautiful. Um, there's one in Tokyo, but we, I was never able to go to the temple on my mission. So the members drive really far or they take the bus, the night bus to be able to go. Actually in the Nagoya mission, there's lots of Bra Brazilians and Peruvians that come and uh, maybe they work in the factories. And so we, um, there, there were actually quite a few Brazilian missionaries that spoke Portuguese or Spanish. Japanese people are seriously the most loving people ever. Um, I love them so much. 
And they're, when you first talk to them, they're usually a little bit shy. They, they can be friendly, but especially if you like, you know, try and talk to them about God or something, they're usually kind of like, why are you talking to me? Like you're, you're an American or, you know, you're just like anything unexpected that they wouldn't usually do is kind of weird to them. So they, but once you get to know them and, um, as you show respect to them and, um, love, like they always open up and, um, they're just really awesome people. The, they love honoring and respecting their ancestors, and so that's super important to them. Um, there's a holiday at, in January called Shogatsu, um, which is like their New Year's party. It's their biggest, it's one of their biggest holidays, and um, they there's like a whole week where they just, you know, kind of ring in the New Year. They, they go and they pray to the shrines and stuff, and um, are just with their family. So w actually when we had Shogatsu, we just had a member and a member meal for lunch and dinner. And so they didn't want us to go and interrupt people in their Shogatsu. So we had to kind of like, you know, stay inside or like, you know, just stay with members because it's really disrespectful to go and knock on their door and it would just give a bad reputation to the church, even though that's the one day when they're all you know, the one week when they're actually home and we couldn't go visit them. So there's Shogatsu. And then in the, they also have Matsuris, which are festivals throughout the year. And they are so much fun. We'd always go and take an investigator with us. And, um, they, you know, they have like a carnival type thing and di different parades and stuff. And they're just so much fun. So I really loved those. So if you ever ride a train in Japan, it's silent, like nobody's talking and, um, it's just quiet. And so, you know, as a missionary, of course you want to talk to everyone you can. And so, um, whenever you talk to them, it's always kind of like, what, why are you talking to me? You know? But, um, so that's always kind of a, different from the cultural norm that we talk to people and we say hello to everybody and ask how people are doing Jap a lot one thing that surprised me is I mean we ask like genki desu ka which is like how are you in America or like everywhere in the world but if you don't know someone in Japan and you ask like genki desu ka they're kind of like huh like they don't understand your question and so it's it's weird I learned to just not ask that <laughs> or just you know other things but um they and they also don't eat and walk at the same time. So that is very rude um, in Japan to do that. And I learned that the hard way as well. Um, one, a lot of the words in Japanese, they sound really similar. And if you're, you know, if you pronounce it wrong, then you say the wrong thing. And so there, when I was a new missionary, we went up to this lady and I was like, oh, like your glasses, they're so, I was trying to say they're really cute. But then she's like, eh, kawaii, and which means like, they're scary. Like what? My glasses are scary. And I was like, no, no. Like, and I, I messed it up. But the, all the time I had stuff like that, where it was just like, dang it. I, I mean, but it was, a, it ended up being a good icebreaker where, you know, we could kind of laugh about it. And I have the chance to tell her why, um, we're here. So yeah, the mistakes end up being a good thing. So in Japan, most people are like a combination of Buddhist and Shinto, which just means that they like for their different holidays or like funerals or marriages and stuff, they celebrate in a Buddhist manner or like a Shinto manner. And so they didn't, I mean, they, even though they have like this beautiful culture and stuff, they're not super religious. And maybe they'll go and pray once a year at Shogatsu, that holiday that I said in, um, they, Overall, whenever we asked people if they believed in God, or they they said, you know, I don't know, or like, I, I don't believe in God, or, you know, they said, I'm Buddhist, and um, it was kind of hard to teach them about Christianity because it was so different from anything that they had heard before. Most Buddhist people, I mean, they'd say, I'm Buddhist, but that doesn't mean that they, you know, that they worshipped actively like we do. I mean, we go to church every week and we do so much, but... Um, the Buddhist people, the Japanese people just, you know, they believe in, you know, different things like reincarnation and, um, and worshiping their ancestors and praying to, you know, different gods. Like one time I asked someone, um, if they believe it in God and they're like, yeah, of course. I mean, like there's the tree God, there's the toilet God, there's all this. And I was like, what? <laughs> but, um, you know, they, they just have so many different images or lack of images about God. So they're just, you know, not very religious. <laughs>
Okay, so when I first tried the food in Japan, I I mean, it's very, it's not as sweet and salty as American food, so I was like, this doesn't really have any flavor, and um, I, my first, you know, a few transfers, I actually carried around a little bag in my purse because I wouldn't be able to eat the food, and so I just, like, and then like put it in and because I didn't want to offend them and so yeah <laughs> it just um that that saved me that got me through to the point where I loved Japanese food I really liked okonomiyaki which is kind of like a cabbage um pancake with you know meat on it and there's different sauces and um there I love sushi and the sashimi and stuff but to be honest when I first tried it I absolutely hated it and because it's just raw fish and so one of my companions, she was from Brazil, and she, she didn't like fish, and she wouldn't eat it. And so we went to a member's house, and there's just this huge plate of sashimi, which is the raw fish. And my companion turned to me, and she said, dozo, which means go ahead. And I was like, what, you're not eating it? And she said, no, I won't eat it. And so I had to eat it all by myself. And I mean, with every bite, I was just like, oh, no. <laughs> but after that, I loved sushi and all of that stuff. So, um yeah, they, I mean, Japanese food is so good, and usually missionaries just grow to love it, and there's lots of, you know, really yummy foods that you can eat there. Um, the ta Japanese people are so polite, and so you always want to show honor and respect to them when you enter the, into their house, and before every meal, you always go like this, and you say, itadakimasu, which means, like, I humbly partake of this meal, um, and a couple of mannerisms that I wish that I would have known before I went is that you do not stick your chopsticks into the rice um, because that's like cursing their house and their family and stuff and so I did that and my trainer about had a heart attack because <laughs> it's very offensive and then another thing is that you never want to go and touch you never want to touch their chopsticks because their own they're their own personal chopsticks and it's kind of I guess it's kind of rude but my companion she she kind of had a heart attack about that too and I, I didn't know so yeah always use your own chopsticks and um one another thing is that Japanese people they they slurp when they drink their soup and so when I first got there that shocked me and I was just mortified but it's actually showing that it's really delicious and that it tastes good and so you know if you ever go to a soup shop or are at a member's house they'll always be slurping if they eat something like that so if you can learn to slurp then you, the members will love it Honestly, Japanese is one of the hardest languages in the world to learn and because it's it's you know it's kind of like backwards from English and grammar and there's different you know characters and three types of alphabet. I mean there's so many things that make Japanese hard to learn. But um one thing that I did learn is that you know the language is not the most shouldn't be your, your most important you know, your biggest priority in the mission it should be having the spirit with you and just doing your best to learn the language. So I mean, getting discouraged about the language isn't really, I mean, it happens to missionaries a lot, but um, as long as you're trying and like you're just showing love to everybody, then it's it's really awesome. But some things that I would recommend for that helped me for learning the language is, of course, flashcards. Um, I always, wherever I was going, I was always studying flashcards on the train. If we ever had some extra time and we're, you know, talking to someone, I was just flipping through and studying them. And then I'd kind of try and rotate them out and go back through. And so that helped me a lot so I could expand my vocabulary. Another thing that I think is really important is reading the Book of Mormon because um, as we read the Book of Mormon, it shows faith. And of course, like there's, you know, the grammar aspect of it, there's different characters and stuff in it. And I didn't really study characters, but um, I think that, you know, doing that will help improve your, you know, comfortability with speaking, yeah, with speaking Japanese. And um, the Pikachu that you'll know that in the MTC, but it's this yellow book and just, you know, mastering the grammar in those, you know, that's all you really need to do to be able to feel confident in, um, you know, your Japanese. And I would recommend, you know, memorizing a few, just a few really important, um, word phrases or something so that you can just be able to throw them out anytime like when I for before I went to the MTC I actually memorized like God is our loving heavenly father just at the first on the first page of the book and in my first lesson I used it and I was like yes like I knew how to say something but um I 
I actually really liked learning the hiragana and the katakana before I went into the MTC because the senseis, they will, you know, they'll start writing in it and they'll give you time to learn it, but it's really hard to just, you know, have this new language and not, you know, and none of it is Latin based, so it's kind of hard to remember and then have to learn a, a new alphabet all at the same time. So if you can just kind of get comfortable with learning the hiragana and katakana, it would help you a lot. And then you wouldn't feel so stressed in the MTC, I think. When we talk to people and OIM, we'd usually introduce ourselves as missionaries and kind of say like that we are volunteers, that we serve people and, you know, we talk about Jesus Christ. And usually um, when we ask people that, or talk about that, they say, ah, uh, like, keko des, like, I'm Buddhist or something, which means, keko des means I'm not interested. So a lot of times it's really hard to find people that, you know, want to hear about the gospel, but um, I, it was really awesome to see that regardless of, um, you know, how Buddhist someone was or how, you know, anti- or like God someone was that regard when they heard about Jesus Christ and his atonement, they changed. And we all I loved just talking about the Savior when we talked to people and saying like what we can become because of him and um how he, we can be freed from our mistakes. And almost every time we talk about that, someone would say, If if those things are real, like I'd be happier, like I want those things. And it just really strengthened my testimony about how much um, the Savior and His Atonement applies to everybody, regardless of where you are. Probably one of my favorite investigators and favorite people in the world is Kobayashi-san. Um, he, we've been being obedient, we've been talking to everybody, OIM, you'll learn that word, um, and we, um, we were at the train station one day, and there was this old woman, and she looked really tired because of the heat. Um, so we went over, and we helped her up the stairs, and we just asked her where she was going and bought her her train ticket for her. Um, and then we um, gave her a little Mormon.org card, and we said, hey, like, anytime you need any help, like, just call us, and we'd love to come, you know, visit or anything. Um, so then a couple days later, we received a call from this man, and his name was Kobayashi-san, and he said that he was the woman that we'd helped son, and so he just started out the phone call, and he said, how did you know, like, why did you help my mom? He told us that that day she'd been really sick, that she would, had um, just made it back to their street um, where she passed out and was sent to the hospital immediately. And he, he started to, his voice was just quivering and he said, he saved my mother's life. How did you know? I was like, oh my goodness. I, I told him about how as Christians, we we're always serving other people, that God loves each of us. So we want to share that love with others. And um, he said, I, I want to know what type of people you are. I want to come to your church. So that next Sunday, um, he came to church. He hadn't known anything about Christianity, um, about God or Jesus Christ. But as he's sitting in sacrament meeting, and um, I mean, he just looked so thoughtful. And after he just came up to me and he said, cross on, like, I have this warm feeling in my heart. I've never felt anything like it. He said, I see light coming from each of your faces. I see Jesus Christ in each of you. And that's where his conversion big began. And it was so hard because anything that could be a, you know, a barrier or something that was hard for a Japanese person to understand was something that Kobayashi-san kind of experienced. And so we, I mean, we, it was just beautiful to see him as he kind of like fought back and forth as he thought, well, I can't, I don't understand this. Like, I'm not good enough for this. Or um, then we'd be like, it's okay. Like we're, we're learning together. Um, and there are some days where, you know, at 7 a.m. or at 10 at night, he'd call me and he'd say, cross son, I'm so happy. I, I don't understand this, but all I know is just how I feel. And I feel so happy. And, um, I, this, this is a beautiful plan that God has for us. And he's not baptized yet, but um, I know that he's learning and that he's still growing and um, doing what he should do. Yeah, I think one of my favorite things is seeing him hear about the Savior and his atonement for the first time. Um, we got some books and we told him, okay, have you ever lied? And we put a book down and, you know, just gradually it became heavy. And we said, Kobayashi-san, these are your sins and these are... Um, the mistakes that we have because of 
you know, our weaknesses and stuff. And then, I mean, he, as he looked at those books, he just started to cry. And he, he was like, I get it now. This is Iasama, like Jesus Christ. He, he's, he's, I want to meet him. That's what he said. But he's the, he was the coolest person in the world. At the end of my mission, I got really sick. I'd been sick for a while. Um, and I was actually kind of passing out on my bike. I was, I was so sick and, you know, going to the, the doctor, I mean, he said, there's nothing wrong with me. I was totally fine. And I just said like, I'm sick. There's something wrong. And, um, so my mission president, he was talking about maybe, you know, sending me home or cause he, I mean, we couldn't figure out what was wrong. And so my dad, he's a doctor. He finally called me because of the mission president and, um, he asked me what was going on. And initially he thought it was this one thing. And so, um, then he went to the temple and he prayed about it. Um, and he felt inspired that it was celiac disease. And so I started following a gluten-free diet and within a week, my symptoms, you know, they just went away and I was able to finish my mission because of that. But it was so hard because like, I didn't know what to eat. There were several days where I just like, I mean, I, I didn't eat because I felt so discouraged about the food, like the fruit and the fruit is so expensive there. And, um, that was hard. And then also like right within that time, um, I just gotten better, kind of gotten the hang of like my celiac disease and, you know, like eating, eat, not eating gluten, even though it was really hard there. Um, but I was on an exchange and this, we were, you know, playing this game cause we were helping the young women's, um, so that they could do their young women's activities every week. And, I actually was running and I hit my toe on a door and it just immediately like snapped into hat snapped into a 90 degree angle and I I mean it hurt so bad and just I had never felt so much pain in my life but I was at the end of my mission so I really wanted to finish strong and stuff but as I was walking back um I I couldn't walk because it hurt so bad and with every every step just this pain shot up into my leg and I was bawling and I didn't know what to do um and in that moment I looked over and I saw the savior he was walking with me and he he had the cross on his shoulders but um as he was crying with me I mean I just felt so much peace as he was walking too and we were walking together and I knew that my broken toe it wasn't a big deal it was just a small thing because he was he was going to suffer for my pain and what I was going through. And even though those next few weeks were really hard because of the pain, um, I mean, I still proselyted. I still did everything I could so that I could, you know, like teach people and help people. But I mean, I had a cane when I was proselyting <laughs> and um, I, I just always thought about that experience where the Savior was with me and he was, you know, carrying my burden and helping me. One time I was at the train station and I went into the bathroom and it, one thing that you'll learn when you get to Japan is a lot of times you can't read signs and you don't know what they're saying. And so I was in the bathroom and I thought, I thought that it was this bus button to flush the toilet, but it actually ended up being this alarm for the whole train station. And so I pressed it and next thing I know there's like lights flashing, there's this, you know, everything's buzzing and I'm like, oh no, like what, what did I do? And so I'm trying to like press it and stop it, but it didn't happen. And so I, I couldn't even find the button to flush the toilet and I just ran out of the bathroom and my companion, she was Japanese and she's like, what did you do? And I was like, the button. And so we just ran out of the train station because we were so scared. And so um, we kept walking for probably like 15 minutes and I could still hear the alarm going at the train station because it was so loud. So yeah, be careful about the signs. <laughs> when, when I first got there, there's fish paste, which I hated. It's like this ground up fish and, you know, they put it, it's like almost jelly form and they put it in lots of soups and stuff. I also had raw whale and shark. They have raw horse. Like there's lots of weird things. One of the biggest things that I learned on my mission is just how much God loves us and does for each of us every single day to be happy. Um, and just that regardless of like what situation you are in life and how hard your life may be, um, that the gospel can help you and that God's always doing something to make you happy and to bring you hope. 
I think the best thing that you could do to prepare for your mission is just to, you know, read the Book of Mormon and really gain a testimony for yourself, um, whether or not it's true. Um, I think that if you can have that foundation for your mission, then, you know, the times where it's really hard, where you feel discouraged, it, you'll be able to remember, well, I had, I have an answer that it's true. So it things are okay. Stay busy and to make goals for yourself. One of the hardest things about returning home from a mission is just, you know, not being a missionary and not having your companion with you to motivate you. And so um, when you get home, it's a good time to just reflect on your mission and think about the the ways that God blessed you. And then also um, a time to, you know, recommit. It's it's where your next mission begins. And so um, there's so many things that you can do to kind of um, be better and improve yourself. The restoration of the gospel is important because it shows how much God loves us. From the beginning of time to up until now, God has always called prophets uh, to help us so that we can be able to um, return to his presence and have um, his guidance every day in our lives. Because um, people gradually rejected the prophets and um, their teachings, there became an apostasy where there wasn't truth on the earth, where um, God... We weren't able to know the true gospel that Jesus Christ had taught us. And so in 1820, Joseph Smith, he was a young boy, but he wanted to know which church was true. And so he asked God, um, and through his divine power, um, the gospel is restored. And we are able to have the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on the earth again. Um, Joseph, Joseph Smith, he translated the Book of Mormon through the power of God which helps us to be able to understand perfectly what God's gospel is. Um, The Book of Mormon and the Bible support each other um, and really help us to know who God is and why we're here. I do have a testimony of this gospel, and I think my favorite thing about it is just how much it strengthens my relationship with the Savior. Um, I know that regardless of um, how weak I am or how much I messed up, that there's always hope that can be found in that Um, He can give me strength every single day. I have peace in my life because I know that I'll be able to live with my family for eternity and that um, God's always here with me. So the first day when we got there, obviously our mission president came to the airport to pick us up and he brought the APs and the other office elders and they told us that we were just going to jump right in and start talking to people. So we've been traveling for I don't even know how many hours it felt like at least a day or two and we were all very tired but really excited to be there and they told us that we were just going to talk to people the whole train ride back to the mission home and so obviously like you hear that and you start panicking because you don't really know the language and you don't really know the right way to do things but even today that's one of my favorite experiences we we talked to people the whole train ride back to the mission home we were able to place some book of mormons we were able to to do what we've been called to do and I could always look back on that experience and say like if I was able to do it that day I can talk to people today um, so that was definitely a great memory and then going off of that I guess the next few days were just kind of a whirlwind of being really tired and trying to figure out what was going on but I just remember meeting my trainer and then meeting the first members and the first investigators and I don't know, it was amazing to me how much love and how much gratitude from them and also just kind of acceptance that I felt. Because my trainer, he was Japanese, so we had a lot of communication problems and everything was foreign for those first few days. We couldn't find a bike that was big enough for me. Um, I couldn't, I didn't know what the food was that I was eating and like I couldn't eat all of it because there was so much of it. And I don't. I knew that that was like against the etiquette rules, but um, I just remember the members and the investigators that we met were all so excited that I was brand new. They were so excited to help me kind of love Japan and love my mission, and they just become a family for you. They they pull you in and they love you, and even if you don't speak their language, they're there for you. So I remember getting my call to the Japan Nagoya mission. And I thought I had heard of most of the missions in the world, but I had no idea where Nagoya was. Um, But Nagoya is located just a few hours south of Tokyo and a few hours north of Osaka. And 
Um, it's right in between those two major cities. So if you ever tell anybody who is Japanese that you lived in Nagoya for two years, they're always like, oh, that's cool because you can go to Tokyo and go to Osaka and go to Kyoto. But I've never been in any of those places. But someday. Um, but Nagoya has, in the Nagoya mission, there's four stakes and one district. Um, there's the Nagano district, which is where they had the Olympics in 1998. It's very mountainous and gets really cold in the winter, really nice summers. And then there's the the Kanazawa Steak, the Nagoya Steak, the Nagoya East Steak, and the Shizuoka Steak. And Shizuoka is where Mount Fuji is actually. So maybe the Tokyo missionaries will tell you that Mount Fuji is in their mission, but the Fuji Ward and the city of Fuji and most of Mount Fuji is in our mission. Oh, George Albert Smith, when he was an apostle, he went to Yokohama, which is in the Tokyo mission. He opened Japan for missionary work. And from there it started spreading. Um, and it came to Nagoya and from there just spread to the rest of the mission. There was a period of time where there were no missionaries there just due to war and other factors, but um, yeah, the the church has been in Japan since 1901. And in Nagoya and the surrounding wards and stakes, it's a little bit more new. Um, I remember some of the areas I served in, there were members there who were the first people that were baptized into that ward. So that was really cool to see kind of the legacy. But yeah, the church is growing in Japan. There, there was actually in one of my wards that I served in, there was a family that they had four generations of members, which was huge for Japan because you, most people are converts or second generation. And so for this family to have four generations of members, um, to them it was a sign that the church was really taking root and starting to expand. Like I said, there's four stakes in one district, and I think there's about 38 wards and branches. Depending on where you go, the branches can be as small as 6 to 10 people, <clears throat> or as large as even 200, 250 people. So there's quite a range of wards and branches, as well as cities and kind of suburbs and rural areas. Um, yeah, the Nagoya Mission's really really different wherever you go. Um, <clears throat> I think Nagoya is the third or fourth largest city in Japan. It's very industrial. Lots of people come there for their jobs. But if you just travel a couple hours north of that, you're in Nagano, where it's very rural. That's where those really small branches are with just a few people. Um, and then you head over to, to Kanazawa, and it's really hilly. There's really pretty like cliffs and coasts. Um, and then there's some really hot areas in the south with some really pretty beaches and then there's also some really green areas to the east where they grow a lot of tea so there's really a little bit of everything in the Nagoya Mission as far as terrain and weather goes yeah so some famous places in the Nagoya Mission like I said Nagano is where they held the Olympics in 1998 so that's it's a really small town but they held the Olympics there so they're really proud of that and also, the Toyota factory, where they make the cars, that's located in just a couple hours, maybe just an hour from Nagoya. Uh, Mount Fuji is a big thing. So Japanese people, just as a people, are they tend to be very gracious. They're very polite, very kind. I never really felt, I guess, like bullied or or disliked. People, even if they're not interested in the church, are very polite and very kind. Um, they're very soft-spoken and, and mm, just easygoing, I guess. I remember coming back to the States and in the airport there was some, some of the airport workers were kind of like yelling back and forth to each other and they just sounded really angry. And I think it's because I was so used to, to Japanese people who are always so polite and so, so soft-spoken when speaking to each other. Um, and I, that translates very much so into the, to the etiquette. Um, there's a lot of, of rules and a lot of things that are very important to do to show respect for one another and to, to kind of show your gratitude for, for people that you know and people that you don't know. Um, for example, whenever you meet someone, you typically bow um, and you use polite Japanese. Like Even in the language, you can see that there's, there's a lot of emphasis on showing respect and showing kind of honor for the people that you're interacting with.
as far as just day-to-day -day etiquette things go, um, <clears throat> so when you enter homes, you always take your shoes off. It would be very rude to enter a home with no shoes, or with shoes on, sorry. Yeah, so you always want to show respect for your seniors, for for the father of a home, or for your, your bishop, or your leaders at church. Um, and you do that by just deferring to their opinions, or if you're at someone's home for for food, for example, you you wait to see to sit until they've sat or until you've been invited to sit, and even then you you're kind of it's always apologetic, I guess. Um, there's polite ways to sit on the floor. Even you're supposed to sit like on your knees, like kneeling down until they invite you to relax and then you can sit cross-legged. The nice thing about being an American or a foreigner going to Japan is that they're very forgiving. So if you don't know how to use your chopsticks in the correct way or if you if you miss one of the major rules of etiquette, they often will just laugh it off and be like, oh, it's because you're not Japanese. And so that was nice that you kind of had that that kind of get out of jail free card. But But when you do treat people with respect and follow their customs and their rules. It was amazing to me the difference that it made. They were they were very receptive and, and much more open when you followed their customs. Um, so another thing about Japanese people is they're very hard working. I remember just being amazed at the hours that they worked at their jobs. We would try to meet with members to help them kind of share the gospel with their friends. and. At first, I thought they were just kind of making excuses because they didn't want to meet with us, both investigators and members. But the more you talk to them and the more you get to know their situation, you find out that they really do work from 7 a.m. until 8 at night. And, and yeah, they work really hard at their jobs. They work long hours, and they're very dedicated to their families. Having that like family pride and honor is very important. Um, and I think that's one reason why kind of showing respect and showing gratitude is so important um, because they're very concerned with how they're portraying themselves and kind of the, the image that they give off, which I think is something that maybe we could do a lot better with here because I think it's really easy for us to be rude to people or to, to tell someone off when in reality, maybe we should just be a little bit more patient or more forgiving. So one more thing about the culture that was kind of difficult as a missionary was that most people are very private. Um, when you approach people on trains, there will be a train that's full of people and no one's talking, it's just dead silent. And so as a missionary, when you talk to people, it, it's kind of uncomfortable for them. Um, and it makes it a little bit more difficult to kind of break down those walls and those barriers. But um, yeah, when you approach people on the streets too, they're kind of very taken aback because that doesn't happen. People don't really talk to strangers or say hello to people that they don't know. And so, yeah, they'll be very surprised when, when we try to talk to them. But it's also really cool because they respect that a lot. You can tell that they, they appreciate the friendliness and they, they wanna talk and they wanna get to know people. It's just a matter of, I guess, shyness or culture. And so that was another interesting thing that I found with people that I talked to in Japan. Um, so one kind of trivial difference is Japanese people, they always shower or bathe at night and it's always like a big family event. They'll have the dad, and I think in a traditional family they'll have the dad, he'll take the first bath and then the mom and then they'll all like rotate in according to seniority. And so, yeah, so any Japanese companions that I had, they always thought that it was really weird that we showered in the morning. And a lot of times they would kind of like become more accustomed to the missionary culture where you have more time in the morning to get ready. Mm -hmm. But many of the Japanese missionaries would shower at night and not shower in the morning, which I thought was really interesting. It's very different from American customs, even if it is something that's kind of trivial. Another interesting thing is the, the sleeping situations. Most people don't have beds. I mean, as, as the times change, it's becoming more common, but it's more common to sleep on futons, which are just like mats that you roll out. Um, so as missionaries, we never had beds. We always slept on those. We would have like one or two kind of padded layers and then a blanket on top, and that's how you sleep. 
The homes in Japan are very, very different from American homes. They're much smaller and they're separated by these sliding doors so that you don't have to take up space with the op doors opening and closing. So Nagoya is a huge city. I think even just within Nagoya there were five different wards, which is quite a few um, compared to kind of like the rest of our mission. And it's very crowded in certain areas, lots and lots of people. And so for that reason, most people don't actually own cars. The most common mode of transportation would probably be bike. As a missionary, you ride your bike everywhere. There, you spend hours and hours on your bike. And yeah, most people in Japan, they'll ride their bikes to work or to the train station and then take a train or a subway to their work. Um, as missionaries, we took trains to district meetings or to zone conferences. If it was anywhere that would take more than an hour or 45 minutes by bike, we would take a, a train. But for the most part, you ride your bike everywhere. Um, which is a new adventure in many ways, especially in the summers and in the winters. In the Nagoya mission, you pretty much cover any type of weather you could think of. There's really, really snowy, cold areas, and there's really, really hot, kind of humid areas. And so riding your bike in the summer is always an adventure. You, you get really sweaty and most people carried around these little handkerchiefs that they would just wipe their face, wipe the sweat off their face with, which seems really gross now, but it was very normal, not only for missionaries, but for everybody. Um, but yeah, most, most apartments don't have central heating or cooling. So they have these little air conditioner things that you hook up, but it's usually only for one room to keep you cool in the summer or warm in the winter. And I just remember wearing a lot of layers in the winter. I would ride my bike around and underneath my, my suit pants, I would have uh, long johns to keep me warm. And I remember the end of the first winter pulling those out and they're putting them away and I held them up and there was like a hole starting to be worn in the bottom just because I'd ridden my bike so much. So yeah, you cover a lot of weather. It's really hot in some places, really cold in other places. Mm -hmm. One thing that consistently amazed me was just the quality of public transportation in Japan. There's tra Trains can get you wherever you need to go basically and they're always on time. I don't think I've ever, I ever saw a train that was late and everyone uses them which is great because I think even if we had those in America, most people might ignore them. Um, but yeah, public transportation is always a safe way to go, especially in big cities like Nagoya. Um, as far as shopping or getting the things that you need, depending on where you are, there's always going to be a supermarket nearby. Like I said, most people don't have cars, so a lot of people will do their shopping. Just They'll bring their own bags and they'll, they'll bike home with those and you just fill you just fill up the bags that you bring and you carry them on the sides of your bike and hope that you don't crash but yeah they're always pretty conveniently located i never had to ride more than 10 or 15 minutes to get to a grocery store and in the big cities they're even closer and they have more things that other places don't have like peanut butter or chocolate or things like that as far as religious beliefs go most Japanese people claim to be Buddhist or Shinto. Um, I've met very few people who who really like, clung to that or who really felt a strong connection to that or obeyed the, the customs, I guess. It's mostly just a cultural thing. And it's interesting when you start talking about Christianity too because most of the people there, you ask them, like, what do you think God is like? And they'll say, I don't know, I've never even thought about God. I don't, I've never even, it's never occurred to me that he might exist. Um, so it's just completely foreign from the culture that I grew up in, where everybody knew not only God, but Jesus Christ and his life. So you're meeting people who, who not only do they not believe in God, but they've never even thought about it. And not only do they not believe in Jesus Christ, but they don't even really know anything about his life. Um, which is really amazing in a lot of ways, because once you can establish that connection with God, everything else becomes a lot easier. There's no kind of other doctrines that conflict with their beliefs. They just, 
become connected with God and then everything else just makes sense. Um, but yeah, Buddhism and Shintoism, those are big religions there. A lot of people will go to the shrines to, to pray when their loved ones get sick or during the New Year holiday. That's one of the biggest holidays. They'll go and they'll like leave their prayers tied to a tree or just different Buddhist customs like that. When I think about my mission, which is usually daily, I am constantly filled with just gratitude for the experience that I had and just nothing but good memories. Um, a mission is, is the hardest thing I've ever done. I've never been more disappointed or more frustrated. I've never been more confused or full of doubt, but I've also never been as happy and as as Christ-like as I was during those two years. When I left on my mission, I had no idea what to expect. I was nervous. I was, I was uneasy, and I remember just being really afraid. Um, but I had no idea that those two years and the people that I met in Japan would change my life so thoroughly. I. I made so many eternal friends and so many so many lasting relationships while I was a missionary. When I think about the most important people in my life, multiple faces and, and people that I came in contact with on my mission come to my mind. I I did not expect to to love my mission as much as I did. I knew that it would be fulfilling and I knew that I would grow from it and that I would serve others, but I had no idea the long-lasting impact that it would have on both me and I guess my future family as well. It changed the way that I view the world. It changed the way that I interact with my Heavenly Father. I love Japan. I love the people that I served. Um, and I love the experiences that I had. Of course, there was disappointment and there were hardships and there were days that were frustrating. But I know that God takes care of his missionaries. I know that he loves and he knows each and every person on this earth. I know it because as a missionary, I was able to feel it. I was able to meet someone for the first time and, and love them, even though I knew nothing about their backgrounds or their personalities. Um... And I know that that is because of the calling that we have as missionaries and because of the love that God has for those people. I, to any missionaries that are, are preparing to go to the Japan Nagoya mission or anywhere in the world, I would just urge you to, to love your missions, to, to make it the experience that, that God knows that it can be, to, to love the people with all your heart and to, to make every day an opportunity to, to serve others, to love the people you come in contact with and the companions that you have, and to come closer to Christ yourself. And I say those things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I love Japanese food, it's so good. Um, I, I don't know, I've never felt as balanced as I did when I ate food in Japan. There's a lot of vegetables, a lot of rice, um, not as much meat just because it's so expensive and not as much dairy or cheese because that's also really expensive. But I guess a typical meal for a missionary, we did most of our cooking at home. We would eat at members' houses every so often, but it wasn't a very consistent thing. So we would make, you wake up in the morning and you put rice in the rice maker and then you just decide what you're going to eat with your rice because rice is just an everyday part of life. And so we would eat a lot of just like vegetable stir fry things. Um, something else we ate a lot of was just like kind of fried chicken with lettuce. I don't know, that was really good I thought. Um, we ate a lot of curry, um, which isn't like the Indian curry that you might have eaten before. It's just kind of chopped up vegetables in this sauce that tastes a little bit different than Indian curry. And I really liked this stuff called mabo dofu. It's just like ground beef 
with tofu in kind of like a spicy sauce. I'm pretty sure it's Chinese, not Japanese, but it was really good. Um, but the foods that I remember are the foods that we would eat at members' houses or when we went out to eat. Um, the one that I miss the most is sushi because I just feel like once you go to Japan and you eat sushi there for cheap and in large amounts, then you come back here and it's just not the same. I've been trying to find good sushi places, but um, in Japan they have sushi places all over the place and they have these really cheap ones where it's like a dollar for a plate and they come around on conveyor belts. So that was one of my favorite places to go. They also have these yakiniku places, which is just like, it's just meat, barbecued meat. They bring out the raw meat and then you barbecue it in front of you, in front of yourself. And yeah, that's really good. One of my favorite dishes was called tonkatsu. And it's just pork that's, it's battered in breadcrumbs and fried in oil. And you just have that on top of cabbage with rice on the side. And that's really good too. With every meal, you're going to eat miso soup. And most of the time, depending on the restaurant, they'll, they'll have either green tea, which you can't drink, or they'll have mugicha, which is barley tea, which you can't drink. Or they'll have water if you ask for it. But yeah, I, I remember mugicha. The members drink it a lot because it's one of the few teas that is okay to drink. And the first time I tasted it, I hated it. It just kind of tastes like like dirt or I heard some missionaries describe it as like cigarette water, which I know sounds terrible, but the more I drank it, the more I learned to love it. And now you can buy it at Asian markets and it's really cheap. So I buy it pretty regularly and I love it now, even though I didn't love it at first. So they have kind of what we would call Japanese McDonald's, which is called Skia. And there they just have rice with meat and you can get like cheese or vegetables or mayonnaise or anything like that on top of that. That was one of my favorite places to go when we didn't have as much money. Something just in general about Japanese food is they they definitely don't put as much sugar in their desserts or in even their everyday products, which <clears throat> which is actually great. Like I got really used to it. And so we would go to the, one time we went to the mission president's house for a meeting and um, my mission president's wife had made French toast with buttermilk syrup. And I remember I ate it that day and I had a headache like the whole day because there was so much sugar in it. And that's when I knew that I'd become used to the Japanese food and their desserts. Unfortunately, I've probably like gone back to my sugar consumption, but it was nice. Yeah, so there's one more, it's called Shabu Shabu, and it's just, it's kind of like fondue, but yeah, they bring out raw meat or vegetables, and you just cook it in this water, maybe it's oil, I'm not sure, but you cook it in that, and then they have sauces for it, and that one was really good too. Well, I didn't eat a ton of crazy foods, but one of the ones that I did eat, it's called Basashi, and it's, it's raw horse meat, and so in Japan, it didn't seem that weird, just because you're eating raw fish and all sorts of raw things but I tell people that I ate raw horse meat and they're always really shocked but it was really good it's a delicacy at sushi restaurants it's always a little bit more expensive than the fish but it tasted great I I liked it a lot but some of the other things that they have is they you can get a license to prepare puffer fish and I guess puffer fish meat or puffer fish have like poison parts in them where if you do it wrong, the whole meat could kill you. But um, yeah, they have certain restaurants, especially over in the Shizuoka area over by Fuji where they serve puffer fish. And I never had the chance to eat that, but someday I want to. Something that uh, Nagoya is famous for is, I forget what it's called. Uh, it's called Hitsumabushi and it's just fried eel. And that was really good. Um, I liked that a lot. Other than that, I don't know. If you don't like rice or if you don't like sushi, then I guess it could be rough. But no, nothing ever really like shocked me. There was nothing that was hard for me to eat. Except, oh, I remember one. So they eat octopus in a lot of things. They'll put octopus in these takoyaki balls, which is just like dough with octopus in it. Or in okonomiyaki, which is like, they're like pancakes with cabbage and whatever you really want in it. 
and so they put octopus in that and it's always really chewy and it kind of tastes like erasers and I struggle to eat that. There's also something called umeboshi which is I think it's like pickled plum and it's super sour and they eat it just plain and I could never do that. That was always hard for me. Um, something that a lot of missionaries would do to new missionaries to kind of like help them become accustomed to the culture I guess is they would have them eat something called natto which is fermented soybeans. And Japanese people love it. They'll eat it for breakfast every day. Um, they'll put like raw egg in it and stir it up with rice and I don't know it's not very good. I, the further along I got the more I ate it. My MDC teacher told me that if you eat natto, if you eat a whole packet of natto then your Japanese will become better. And so I remember my trainer who was Japanese, he would eat it every morning. And one day I said, I'm going to eat it with you. And I did. I ate all of it. And it was hard, but it was great. I mean, I gained the experience, which was worth it, I think. So the Japanese language is basically the opposite of English. The order is different. The letters are different. Um, the way that you speak is different. But... I don't know, I remember getting my call and everybody was telling me, oh, you're going to Japan, that's, that's an impossible language, you're going to spend two years and you're still not going to know the language. And I don't know, I, I tried not to believe that. And I think that throughout my mission, more than I felt like it was difficult, I felt like it was amazing that we were learning it. We would meet people who had lived in Japan for years and years and they spoke hardly any Japanese and then we'd only been there a couple months and we were speaking pretty fluently and to me that was just amazing it was just um, kind of a testament to the power and the help that Heavenly Father gives us when we're learning a language but Japanese so there's just written Japanese there's three different alphabets there's one called hiragana it's it's just the phonetic alphabet and then there's one called katakana, which is the phonetic alphabet for words that aren't Japanese. So, for example, like McDonald's. They don't say McDonald's, they say makudonarudo. And they would write that in katakana. But any Japanese word is in hiragana. And then they have the characters, the kanji, which that, that, that takes years and years to learn, I think. And, and as a missionary, you learn some of them, but they're not super vital to your everyday activities in the Book of Mormon and in anything that you'll have to read they'll have the hiragana written by the kanji so that you can know how to pronounce it. Um, as far as speaking goes um, the order is typically, I haven't thought about this in a long time, but the order of, of sentences is typically subject, object, verb. So you say who's doing it and then what they're doing or where they're going to and then you always end with the verb and for every noun that you use, there's going to be a particle that will mark what that noun's doing. So you could say like, I or me, and then you have to mark that as the topic or the object or whatever, whatever role that's playing in the sentence. Um, and then you always end with a verb. And with the verbs, there's a bunch of different ways to end verbs to change what you're trying to say. So you can say like, I did go or I didn't go or I want to go, or I think I should go, and all of those just, you change those at the end of the, the verb. So I should give an example maybe. So if you want to say like, I went to church, you would say like, watashi, which means I. Watashi wa kyokai ni ikimashita. So you'd say like, watashi, that's I, and wa is the topic marker. So I'm the topic of the sentence. And then um, kyokai, that means church. And then ni is a direction particle, so that tells you that you're going to the church. And then ikimashita, that's the verb iku, means to go. And by changing it to ikimashita, that means went, past tense. So it's kind of complicated, but it's fun. I loved learning Japanese, and I think that it's definitely possible, no matter how much people tell you, no matter how many people tell you that it's difficult. Um, one kind of difficult part about Japanese is just the, the vagueness. They're not very direct in their speaking. They talk in a very roundabout way just to be more polite. And that was really hard for me to, to get. Um, especially because as missionaries, we, we always want to be polite and we always want to be respectful. 
and there's so many rules for how to do that. So that was something that was hard for me to pick up, but I mean, you just ask people a million questions and do whatever you can to learn the language and it comes. Japanese pronunciation seems like it would be really hard, but it's actually a lot easier than English, I think, because everything is just said however it's spelled. There's no exceptions or tricks. Um, so they have, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, I think it's 46 different sounds and it's like ah, ee, oo, e, o, ka, ki, ku, ke, ko. They always go together. Like there would be two letters in English maybe, but um, it's just one character, like ka, ki, that's ka is one character, ki is one character, or like sa, shi, su, se, so. Does that make sense? And so, um, yeah, it's always the same no matter what word it's in. There are some words that are more difficult to say. Um, it took me six months to be able to say McDonald's just because those words were the hardest for me. The English words that they say in with Japanese accents like makudonarudo or like allergies, they would say arerugi. And that was really hard for me to get because I always just wanted to say it like the English way. Um, but for the most part, the pronunciation is really straightforward. And there's a couple tricky sounds, like the R sound is kind of like a D, it's kind of like an L, it's kind of like an R, and so that one took me a while to get. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. So the word for truth would be shindi, and it's S-H-I-N-R-I, but it's really hard to say that R because a lot of people will say like shinri or like shindi or, I don't know, it's, it's supposed to be shindi, I hope I'm saying it right, but that one was hard for me to say. Sometimes they have these double consonants as well where you're supposed to do a glottal stop. So for example, um, if you're trying to say like cut, you would say kite. But if you're trying to say like come, it would be like kite. And so those are two different words, but they sound really similar. You just have to have that glottal stop. And then another difficult thing was sometimes they have elongated vowels. So for example, my trainer's name was Elder Ogaki. Um, and the O needs to be long or else it means something completely different. So a lot of missionaries will struggle with remembering where those long consonants are and giving them the length that they need because that can also be two different words. Because, for example, in the Japanese class I'm taking at BYU right now, um, we just had a quiz over a bunch of words that sound the same, but they're really different. So one of the examples is shoujo means little girl, but shoujo means like an invitation or a letter. And so those sound really similar, but you can tell that it's shoujo, like the second, the jo is a little bit shorter. And shoujo, they're both long. So yeah, that's one difficult but interesting part about Japanese. Japanese. <laughs> えっと、朝起きる時とか、ま、夜寝る前にとか、ま、食べる前にでも私たちは ま、それとも神様が本当にいるかどうか知りたければ、それとも、ま、神様が本当にいるかどうか知りたいと思うならば、この その、その、手紙が受ける。手紙を受ける人に呼びかけますね。例えば、ま、天皇お父様と言って、それからその自分の感謝とか、その神様から与えられた祝福とかそういうことに感謝するんですね。例えば、ま、家族とか仕事とか
それで、まあ、質問とか知りたいこととか助けが必要な時でも、まあ、神様に聞くことができます。例えばうんお母さんが病気から治ることができるように祝福してくださいとか、えー、とこの試験でいい成績を取れるように祝福してくださいとか、えーとまあ、家族が幸せになることができるように祝福してくださいまあ質問でもいいですね、まあ、神様が本当にいますかとか神様がいるかどうか知ることができますように助けてくださいとかそういうお願いとか助けを求めることができますで最後にイエス・キリストのおかげで私たちが神様と話すことができるのでイエス・キリストの名前によって終わりますねなので一番最後にイエス・キリストの皆によりアーメンと言いますなのでまず全部まとめると天のお父様と言って感謝を告げてそれから、まあ、祝福とか助けを求めることで最後にイエス・キリストの皆によってアーメンと言いますでそういうお祈りによって本当にその答えを得ることができて神様から助けを得ることができると自分の経験から学んできましたできるだけ毎日お祈りするようにしますで本当に自分の人生にも役に立つ,立つと信じていますのでぜひお祈りしてみてくださいね。So when I got to my first area, we didn't really have very much going on. I remember we had a couple investigators, but they had all been investigators for a very long time. And we had zone conference my second or third week there. And my mission president was talking about these key indicators and these like programs and things that we were supposed to be implementing, and I had never really heard of any of them. And I just didn't feel like we were anywhere close to that. So we went home from that zone conference, and I talked to my trainer, and we just made a game plan for how we were going to kind of revamp our area because it wasn't it wasn't going super well, I guess.、Um, and so we just started from square one. We started working with members, we started visiting less active members. Part member families,、um, we talked to everybody we saw, and it was slow for sure. But I remember there was this one lady, Sister Hayashi, and she, her son had been baptized just a couple weeks before I got to the area. And he had come to church many times. They were like, we knew him really well. We worked with him and helped him as a new member. But she was always really closed off. Um, the one time that I did meet her, she said, like, Please stop bothering me with your church. I already have a church.、Um, I don't want to learn from you ever. So, so please just leave me alone. And so, the more we worked with her son, Taishi, the more we were thinking, like, We can't just let this opportunity pass away because she, like, obviously, we're, we're connected to him enough that we can help her. And so we just continued to try to serve him and to, to kind of show our love for him and our friendship for him so that she would maybe be more receptive.、Um, and so, yeah, we kept trying. And then one day we brought it up again and we said, like, Do you want to start hearing the lessons again? And she kind of shut us down like she did the first time. And she, she just said, like, Please stop. Like, I'm, I'm not interested. So then that Sunday, Taishi showed up to church and she was with him. And we were very confused by that because she had just told us that she didn't want anything to do with our church. But then she showed up at church. And so we didn't really know like, what to do, if we should talk to her or just leave her alone.、Um, but after church, she came up to us and she said, I want you to help my son find a job because he just graduated from high school and he's not doing anything. And I think you guys can help him. And so we started helping him. And just through that service, she opened up a lot and she said to us, A couple weeks later, she said, I'm ready to study with you again. And so that was just a miracle to me that she went from being so closed off to being so open just through kind of the example of her son, as well as just some simple acts of service from us. I remember afterwards she told us, like, I wasn't going to give your church a second chance, but I saw my son and how he changed and how he gained friends and how he, he prayed and read the Book of Mormon. And to me, that was inspiring. Um, so one day we were teaching her and we got to the word of wisdom. 
And she just kind of, before we had even started the lesson, we mentioned the word of wisdom. She said, oh, this is where I'm done. Like, this is where I cannot accept your beliefs. I, I just cannot understand why coffee's bad or why, why this word of wisdom has to exist. Like, if I can be close to God when I drink coffee, then, like, I don't see a problem with it. And she was very, 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 what's the word, confrontational. She did not want to hear what we had to say about the word of wisdom, and she did not want to change what she was doing. Um, and so we, we tried to kind of like explain to her, but it just turned into a battle. And so we stopped and we just said, what it comes down to is whether or not you believe this commandment comes from God, or if you believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. And so she said, like, I'll think about it. But she was still really angry. And so we just said, okay, we'll, we'll let you think about it. Um, will you say a closing prayer so that we can finish this lesson? And she said, I can't. Like, I don't feel like I'm in the right state of mind to say a closing prayer. Um, I'll have my son do it. So her son, he said this really heartfelt prayer. And so we opened our eyes and she was just crying. And she said, I'm ready to pray now. And so she prayed. And up until that point, like, she had been receptive, but she had been also a little bit confrontational the entire time. Like, really defensive of her beliefs and really antagonistic towards ours. Um, but she prayed, and everyone that was there was just crying. Um, and the Spirit just came very strongly. Like, even, even today, it's one of the most powerful experiences that I've ever had with the Spirit, where we all just knew that, that it didn't, that coffee didn't matter, and that that these trivial things that we were worried about weren't that important. And so she she finished her prayer, and just she didn't have to say anything, but we all just knew that she she knew, and she had decided. So my companion committed her to be baptized a couple weeks from a couple weeks from that date, and there were no problems after that. It was kind of a miracle because we were anticipating the word of wisdom to be a huge problem as well as tithing. But as we taught her those things, I think she just remembered that one experience where she just felt it so strongly and she never had any doubts or problems. And so she was baptized on Christmas actually and her son was able to baptize her and yeah, it was just a really special experience. She transformed from from being very callous and very closed off to being super open and kind and one of the one of the key members of the ward. And to me that was just amazing to see that transformation that came through the spirit as well as through the example of her son and through the kindness of members. Um, but most importantly through the power of prayer, I think. I would just say Definitely know the Book of Mormon and have a testimony of the things that you're going to be teaching. And also, I remember I asked a lot of people, like, how can I prepare for the language? Because everybody told me that Japanese was going to be really difficult. But um, my advice would just to be, do what you can, but don't feel like you have to learn Japanese before you go into the MTC. Because they're going to do a really good job of teaching you. And, yeah, it would be stressful to try to learn it all by yourself and to know where to start, I think. Yeah, I would say just use your time wisely even at the MTC. I think it's easy to think that you're there for so long that it's not that important or it's not really a part of your mission, but you can get really far ahead both in the language and spiritually if you use your time wisely in the MTC and if you, you continue to make goals and push yourself and to try to treat it like a real mission experience and not just something that's preparing you for your mission, but actually part of your mission.